Hello and welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. Today we're going to be talking about situationism and evil. So situationism is a concept that we've talked about before, way back when we talked about uh, the self and personality. And we talked about the way in which perhaps our personalities are the result of the situations we find ourselves in and not the result of some kind of uh, disp internal dispositions that, that are part of us that are expressed through the situations we find ourselves in. So we've talked about this concept of situation before, situationism before as it relates to personalities, but we're now going to talk about this, this um, uh, situational, the situational constraints and how they influence, influence our moral actions. So we're going to be thinking about how uh, the, the extent to which our kind of moral dispositions, our moral behaviors are the result of the situations we find ourselves in, or instead if they're the result of some kind of underlying character traits that we have that make us good people or evil people. So um, the article today uses this concept evil, and I'm a little, um, you know, ambiguous about this concept. I'm not crazy about it. Uh, I think, you know, the concept of evil carries a lot of uh, semi-religious connotations to us, to it that I don't, you know, want to invoke here. Um, but I think uh, that, uh, that um, Zimbardo, the person that you read uh, the article by today, um, does offer a kind of helpful definition of what evil, what he means by evil. So I want us to take a look at that first. So how does he define evil? Well, in effect, what Zimbar Zimbardo says is, is that evil is intentionally behaving or causing others to act in ways that demean, dehumanize, harm, destroy, or kill innocent people, excluding accidental or unintended harmful outcomes. So in effect, the way in which Zimbardo uh, describes um, uh, evil is the, intentionally, the intentional causing of harm, uh, destruction, or death to innocent people, okay? So, so that's the kind of concept that we're going to use here for evil. And I think once we have this concept defined, um, the kinds of things that, you know, that stand out as evil will become clear to us, or the things that count as evil acts will become clear to us. And I'm gonna start with you know, some of the worst harms that we can do for other people. So that, that, that'll sort of bring this kind of idea of, of, of harm into focus, um, this idea of evil into focus. And so we're going to talk about, um, you know, oftentimes instances of uh, killing other people. Um, Stanford Prison Experiments, the first one that I'm going to discuss, that Zimbardo spends a lot of time talking about here, uh, obviously does not involve uh, murder. Um, but uh, this is a situation where uh, people certainly, these Stanford students certainly demeaned and harmed their fellow classmates by having them stripped down, uh, making fun of them, having them stand in cold areas, totally nude. Um, all of that is harmful to other people. And so that would fall under, and, and you know, is intentionally performed by these students who happen to be given this role. So that would fall under the, um, the category of an evil act, according to Zimbardo. That would count as evil. Another kind of instance um, of evil might be something like a, a kind of bus bombing, right? Um, now, it's interesting that um, the article suggests about uh, killing of innocent people, intentionally killing of innocent people. And, and I think that's there to, you know, uh, take out instances of um, wartime violence. So if we're committing violence, harming people during a war, Maybe that's something different than what um, specifically Zimbardo is talking about. And certainly I think that terrorists or suicide bombers may think that they are soldiers in a war who are attacking people who are not innocent. Maybe they have this kind of notion of collective guilt that the citizens of uh, the Israeli state who are on this bus are partially responsible or are responsible for um, the, uh, you know, what they see as uh, harm to uh, Palestinians um, in this case. Uh, so, so maybe there is a kind of theory of collective guilt there, but I do think Zimbardo is not buying into that kind of theory of collective guilt. And he would say that the suicide bomber in this case is definitely committing an evil act, right? They, th these are just other people going about their, uh, their uh, day, their daily life on their way to work or whatever. Um, and uh, they are, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, from the point of view of the person attacking in this case, innocent. And, um, uh, and so therefore the uh, fact that they behave in this way is to perform an evil act. Another kind of instance of this um, would be the uh, murder of 
uh, innocent, um, the massacre of innocent uh, Afghani civilians um, during, uh, uh, in this particular instance, this is uh, the aftermath of a, um, of a massacre committed by uh, a US staff sergeant, Robert Bales, who ended up murdering 16 civilians, Afghani civilians near Kandahar. Um, nine of these civilians were children. This was in retaliation for an IED attack on the US that occurred in the region several days earlier. So I think this is a kind of another instance of uh, assigning collective guilt and um, ending up perpetrating evil acts as a result of that. And this clearly is a, a very straightforward evil act. This is the murder of innocent people. Okay, so um, with those kinds of notions of what it, can, it is to count as an evil act in mind, and these are some of the most evil acts, these last few I've talked about that involve murder, a kind of key question that we're interested in in this article can now be articulated. And that question is, well, what causes people, um, you know, for example, Staff Sergeant Robert Bales, the suicide bomber, what causes those people to perform these evil actions? And so both the Zimbardo piece that you've read for today and also the podcast you're listening to on terrorism uh, featuring uh, um, Scott Atran bring some different uh, views on this topic to bear. So, um, in this literature, the literature that we're looking at for evil, um, like a lot of the other literature we've, pre we've covered previously, it involves a, a kind of opposition between two views, which are offering uh, different explanations of what's going on here. So um, one of these views uh, of how to explain why people perform evil acts is what we're going to call the dispositional view. And so according to this view, a person's actions are dependent on and influenced by inherent personality traits. So the reason that we are good people is because we have a good personality, a good character, and that uh, eventuates in our uh, performing actions in appropriate ways, performing the right actions. Or if you're a bad person, then uh, what explains that according to the dispositional view is that you have an inherent evil or bad personality or, or some inherent uh, uh, bad personality traits that have acting in these evil ways, right? There have been many different proponents of uh, the dispositional view. Many moral philosophers throughout time, for example, have promoted this view. Here's one example. Um, so uh, Jesus, right, says that what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So I think here Jesus is, is clearly adopting a kind of dispositional view that the evil is sort of bubbling up from within us and not sort of foisted on us externally from situations. Another example of someone who embraces the dispositional view is the philosopher Immanuel Kant, um, a really uh, influential philosopher, one of the most influential philosophers of all time. Um, who uh, wrote that human beings are afflicted with an innate depravity or perversity of the heart. Such depravity is a feature of the radical evil in human nature through which we come to heed the claims of self-love over those of morality. So this is a view that um, Kant puts forward in his work, Religion Within the Bounds of Moral Reason. It's another example of someone embracing the dispositional view. Now, opposed to this view in, uh, in uh, um, Zimbardo's article, and uh, in the way that we're going to talk about these concepts as well, is the idea of a kind of situational view. And again, we've offered suggestions or, or, or looked at previous accounts of these views. So what a situational view says, or a situation's view says, is that a person's actions are dependent on and influenced by situation, not necessarily inherent traits, right? So the key thing is the situation that a person finds himself in. And this is going to have much more effect on what the, how they ultimately act than any kind of internal traits. Now, again, remember, we've talked about the idea that, um, that uh, uh, you know, with any of these kinds of views, there's going to be a kind of competition between them. And we're probably not going to end up like either saying that morality itself is situationist in nature or that it is dispositional in nature. The truth is probably going to lie somewhere in the middle. And I want you to be thinking about that as we discuss these views. But uh, just for another example of Zimbardo's 
position on this. He says that the human mind is so marvelous that it can adapt to virtually any known environmental circumstance in order to survive, to create, and to destroy as necessary. We are not born with tendencies toward good or evil, but with mental templates to do either, okay? Um, he goes on, the basic paradigm presented in this chapter illustrates the relative ease with which ordinary good men and women can be induced into behaving in evil ways by turning on or off one or another social situational variable. And I want you to bear in mind, again, always keep in mind throughout this, what we mean by evil here. So people who don't perform evil acts um, end up uh, being it can end up being induced to behave in evil ways based on their social situations and presumably things can go the other way as well. People who um, uh, perform evil acts uh, or who uh, yeah, do evil things in some situations can be made to be to perform in morally good ways if they're put in different situations. So these are the two views that are in uh, in contrast with one another that are being argued for in relation to one another. And Zimbardo thinks that essentially Zimbardo himself promotes the uh, situationist perspective. That's what he's arguing for throughout this paper. But he acknowledges that proponents of a kind of situational view of ethics face an uphill climb that those who embrace dispositionalism do not, right? Um, so he says the dispositional analysis, right? The analysis that says, evil actions come from within, good actions come from within, has the comforting side effect of enabling those who have not yet done wrong, wrong to righteously assert, not me, I am different from those kind of people who did that evil deed, right? It allows us to draw a distinction between ourselves and other people, other, other people who've done evil things, and right, no one wants to be Hitler, so why wouldn't we do that, right? So this view, by positing a me, us, them distinction, uh, allows us to live with the illusion that comes from not recognizing the set of situational and structural circumstances that empowered others, like ourselves, right? So, so um, you know, if I think of, you know, uh, this me, the good people, us, the good people, them, the bad people distinction, um, then I can have the illusion that I, as a member of the kind of situational uh, milieu that this person who did this evil thing finds themselves in, if I believe that, that you know, their evil act is up to them uh, and, and their dispositions, then that has the additional comforting fact of making it the case that I'm not a contributor, contributory factor in their evil in any way, right? All of this allows us to take false pride in believing, right, that we're not not that kind of person, that we are good people, and that the other people, the people who do the bad things, are evil people because of what's inside of them. But Zimbardo rejects this situational view. So what does he argue instead? Well, he says, right, that he believes that dispositional orientations are more likely to correlate with affluence, right? So additionally, he thinks that not only is it the case that, that a kind of dispositional view is comforting to people who have not yet committed heinous crimes, right? Or, or done evil acts, um, which may be, uh, um, you know, wealthy academics uh, or um, uh, people uh, from, um, you know, uh, socially um, uh, uh, respected milieus, like the people who produce these theories, um, they have a kind of interest in promoting this kind of dispositional view because they haven't done anything evil themselves. And then additionally, um, they, are, they are people who find themselves in situations that are going to make it so that it's sort of easy to behave in moral ways, right? So Zimbardo again writes, I believe that dispositional orientations on morality, he means here, are more likely to co correlate with affluence, with having money. Right? So the rich want to take full credit for their success, whereas the situationists tell more from the lower classes who want to explain the obvious dysfunctional lifestyles of those around them in terms of external circumstances rather than internal failures, right? So um, uh, people who have had, been in good situations for their life and who have, for that reason, not been put in situations that lead to their performing uh, immoral or evil acts, will be more likely to adopt a dispositional view 
which emphasizes, you know, the stuff that's inside of them that makes them a good person instead of the really awesome situations that they happen to have found themselves in. So a lot of this article, again, Zimbardo is arguing that situationalism is correct. And so a lot of the article is, is sort of discussing situational ways, uh, situational variables in which people can be led to uh, perform in evil ways, right? And again, Zimbardo's theory here is that it's these situational variables that make most of the difference, not something about our characters that uh, typically prevents us from, you know, being um, uh, marauders, uh, you know, being um, uh, being uh, people who kill the innocent in, in, um, in egregious ways, right, in times of war. It's, it's not like something about us that keeps us from doing those things. It's just that we're in good situations where we haven't been, um, be, the situational variables haven't been shaped in a way to make us behave more. Orally. So a lot of these experiments are going to be like looking at and teasing out what are the situational variables that make a difference and are acting morally or immorally. And um, one of the first studies that's really influential that uh, Zimbardo discusses here on this point is Milgram's, uh, um, Milgram's obedience studies. And he really talks about the situational variables that Milgram uses, right? So Milgram's hypothesis, again, was that people can be induced into behaving in evil ways by turning off on or off one or another social situational variable. So again, Milgram's uh, work is in a uh, large respect a kind of response to the Holocaust. And he's thinking about how ordinary German citizens participate in all these levels with this Holocaust in which um, you know, other uh, fellow citizens, Jewish citizens uh, were murdered in which um, other, uh, you know, ethnic groups, uh, Poles, Slovaks, and so on, were murdered by the state. And also people, other people who were considered undesirable, who, have ha who had handicaps or um, alternate ways of life, in which all of those people, I mean, so all of these ordinary Germans participated in this genocidal act. And so the question is, why did they do that? And so in a lot of ways, Milgram's work on this is inspired by World War II and the Holocaust. And his thesis is that in fact, ordinary people can be induced into behaving in evil ways by turning off one or another social situational variable. So if we think about the study itself, what happens in the study? Well, um, people are told that um, they, uh, right, right. So, they're, um, so what happens is an experimental participant comes with someone else they believe to be an experimental participant, but this person that they're with is really working with the experimenters. Um, there's a person in a lab coat who tells them a story of what they're up to. They're really interested in people's capacity to um, learn or to memorize information. The studies that they're performing here will be invaluably uh, helpful in thinking about how education works. Right, um, and so, so they're given this kind of acceptable justification or rationale for engaging in this study. And the study has this kind of undesirable component to it. So if I'm brought in as the experimental participant, I'm always gonna be given the role of teacher, right? The, the person who's with me, who I think is an experimental participant is actually, who's actually again working with the experimenters is uh, given the role of student, right? And now I'm trying to get this person to memorize a list of words. And the thought is whether um, punishment leads to better memorization. So the other person, I believe just to be another experimental participant is trying to remember these words. And whenever they get it wrong, then uh, the person running the study tells me, well, you have to deliver this uh, shock to the person, right? So um, if I give this cover story that it's for the good of education, that's going to make me, if I'm given this cover story, then that's going to make me more likely to engage in the behavior where I um, increase shocking. Um, right, so, so um, what we're really thinking about here is uh, how often do people comply in this study with uh, administering the maximum rate of 450 volt shock uh, to participants, right? So again, um, I, if I'm the experimental participant, I'm told, okay, you're the teacher. This other participant is gonna to try to memorize these words. If they get it wrong, you have to deliver a shock. 
and you have to turn up the dial each time you deliver the shock to make it stronger. Um, ultimately getting to this huge 450 volt shock, right? So um, every time they get it wrong, and of course they get it wrong a lot, that's the point of the study, I have to deliver the shock and I have to turn it up. Um, if the cover story I've been told is that this is good for, uh, for um, education, that's gonna make me more likely to deliver the shock. Um, if a lot of these variables are, are really organized in the right way, you can get people to deliver that 450 volt shock 90% of that, the time. But also if you change these variables, if you change them in certain ways, if you don't make them do some of these things, then the compliance rate with delivering that 450 uh, uh, volt shock can drop down to as low as 10%, right? So depending on which situational variables you turn on, you can make people comply 90% of the time, or um, they may comply as low as 10% of the time. Again, all these participants are ordinary people. So the variables, the cover story we've talked about, I can also, um, the experimenters sometimes have people make a contractual obligation, either verbal or written, say, yes, I will deliver the 450 volt shock if the person gets so many of these memorization tasks wrong. Making that commitment leads people to, uh, to, um, to uh, participate and uh, deliver the 450 volt shock more often than not. If they're not asked to make that commitment, they more of them tend to drop out earlier. Additionally, in this experiment, uh, participants are given meaningful roles to play. So the role of telling people they're a teacher and a student, like giving them those roles actually leads to more compliance than if you just say experimenter one and experimenter two, or experimental participant one, experimental participant two. Um, additionally, there are uh, basic, uh, if there are basic rules to follow, that can make uh, um, it more likely to get compliance uh, in a situation which you're trying to get people to comply with an e with a, um, a evil uh, an evil act, right? So if there are basic rules, then that leads to more compliance, right? So you might say, failure to respond must be treated as an error, right? So if this person on the other side you, you know, the, the, the student in the Milgram uh, paradigm just fails to give an answer, that counts as an error. That's a very basic clear rule that I can apply in any situation. And giving someone those basic rules, basic rules like that leads them to comply more often in, uh, evil in the production of evil action. Okay, so again, the thesis is that people can be induced uh, into behaving in these evil ways. Here are some more factors, right? If I alter the semantics of the act, if I uh, tell people that they're, you know, not hurting victims, but helping learners, I can get more compliance. If I uh, create opportunities for diffusing responsibility, right? So if the experimenter says something like, and this was a variance they tried, um, it's the experiment that's requiring you to do this, John, say the experimental participant is named John. It's not you, it's the, it's the experimental paradigm that diffuses responsibility from me, the experimental participant delivering the shock. And that makes it more likely that I will deliver the shock, right? Additionally, um, we know that if we start the path to evil with a small insignificant step, we'll be more likely to get people all the way to performing a, an evil act um, than if we just throw them into the deep end and have them perform the evil act to begin with, right? So notably in the Milgram study, people steadily increased the voltage of the shock until they got up to 450. So it's a little bit of a shoe in the door effect. They weren't just asked to shock um, from, uh, to uh, start with 450, right? So again, the, the increase uh, needs to be gradual and then gradually, um, and then additionally, if I can gradually change the influence of authority from just to unjust, that will be also helpful in inducing action. So to begin with, these people say, oh yeah, I mean, you know, the person who's the uh, student in the Milgram paradigm, par paragram, a paradigm says, yes, I'm happy to participate as the student in this case. Um, the experimenter says, this is gonna be a good experiment or whatever. Um, so everything's just to begin with, but then the person later on is they're getting more and more shock, shocks, they would be acting and saying like, oh, I have a heart condition, I can't take this or whatever, right? But as long as that kind of change to this like unjust act of harming a person who could be seriously injured, 
with this shock. As long as that's affected gradually, you can get people to participate at much higher rates. Right. Additionally, if we make exit costs high, that's going to be make a difference as well. So if you tell people, well, if you leave the experiment, we have to start over and do this all again, right? That does make the costs of leaving harder. So all of these kinds of change of individual variables, the Milgram experiment shows, and this is discussed again, discussed again in uh, the uh, Zimbardo article. All of these different uh, situational factors can contribute to making people more likely to go along with evil actions. Um, so uh, I want to look now at some other specific uh, aspects that uh, Zimbardo discusses in which, um, in which uh, uh, perpetrator, I'm sorry, in which uh, we can get people to, um, you know, be more likely to behave in evil ways by changing situational variants. So his next idea is um, depends upon the uh, de-individuation of perpetrators, right? So if uh, I, you know, I'm a demagogue or a warlord who wants to uh, train people to harm others um, or to hate others, then the way I can do that is to try and de-individuate um, the actions of the people that of my of my um, warriors, right? So I can I can try and make them feel less like individuals, right? If someone feels more like a, less like a unique individual, they will be more likely to commit evil acts. That's the idea, right? Um, there, there's a, a whole lot of literature looking at this and the results of de-individuation and how that leads to um, evil actions. So a lot of this is discussed in the article, right? Um, so uh, for example, we know that uh, de-individuated women provided more and stronger shocks to uh, women identified by name in a particular study. I'm not uh, gonna talk about the details of the study, it's discussed in the article, but the basic idea is that, um, uh, you know, uh, the people that uh, sort of similar to a, a Milgram paradigm, but the people that are getting shocked are either identified with names. So it's like, okay, this person you're gonna deliver this talk to, Sally, she has this, you know, she's um, uh, going to be the subject of the shock or whatever. Or they're, they're, they say, you're going to deliver um, a uh, shock uh, to um, woman number X, Y, or, 357 and 86. I, I realized just now that I screwed that up. I was suggesting that de-individuate de-individuating the victim is going to lead for more, lead to more evil acts. And there is some evidence of that as well. But also de-individuating the perpet, uh, the perpetrator leads to more evil acts. So in this particular experiment, it's not that you're told you're going to shock Sally, it's that um, suppose you're the experimental. Uh, the person who's participating in the study, if the experimenter says, okay, Sally, deliver the shock now, or, or alternatively says, okay, experimental participant, 8837, deliver the shock now. If you are referred to by number rather than name, which is, of course, de-individuating to you, then you will be more likely to commit a harmful act, right? So we can make compliance with the harmful act go up if we de-individuate you as the perpetrator of the evil act. Um, there uh, are a series of studies that are really fun. They're discussed in the paper uh, with children um, being aggressive when they are costumed as opposed to when they're not costumed, uh, beating up a, a doll that's used in these experiments, right, and becoming uh, very violent towards it after they're uh, told that they're at a cost, I mean, after they're you know, after a costume party is brought about during uh, a particular experiment. So if we put the children into these, these clothes that hide who they are as individuals, they act in much more violent ways. Um, it's also been found, and this again is discussed in the article, that through ethnographic research, that societies that change the appearance of their warriors are most likely to kill, torture, and mutilate their enemies. So this research is done over large groups of uh, tribal warriors in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, so this is what they find, that um, the, the tribes that uh, change the appearance of their warriors are more likely to engage in evil acts. Um, 
so uh, all of this uh, suggests that the individuation of perpetrators matters. Um, if we were meeting in class, I would have us now discuss the uh, study involving the abandoned car, which takes place either in Palo Alto versus the Bronx. And what I want you to think about uh, in the study, I'm not going to have you, obviously, I mean, you, you, you should think through this in your own time as you're reading the article. But one thing I want you to bear in mind about this article is, okay, what are the important variables for the vandalism to occur uh, to this car, either in Palo Alto or in the Bronx? And so why do these factors then matter? And so some of these, I think, are, are um, situational facts that don't have to do with the individuating perpetrators. But at this point, uh, Zimbardo is very interested in the facts that do um, uh, are a result of the de-individuation of the perpetrator. So think about that as you read through it. OK, so we can talk about the de-individuation of the perpetrators, making them feel like one amongst a sea of many. But we can also talk about the dehumanization of victims. And it seems that one key aspect in promoting evil or evil action is the dehumanization of victims. So making our victims uh, or making us feel as though the victims of the would-be evil acts that we would commit are um, not human in the same sense we are. They are other in some way. And this has been a kind of common uh, aspect to a lot of uh, the, um, the uh, uh, you know, um, work by or, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, ways in which uh, demagogues have led uh, others to be the subject of, uh, of violence, uh, that is to dehumanize their victims, okay? So one of the studies discussed that in, in the reading that you're going to look at is a study by Bandera et al., um, these uh, participants had, uh, or these experimenters had participants uh, led to believe that they were overhearing the research assistant tell the experimenter about um, students that they were, uh, about some students who were in um, the uh, experiment. So the research assistant is helping the experimenter out, the head experimenter for the study. Um, and uh, the students who are going to be the test subjects um, over here, the research assistant describing uh, the people who are going to be the subject this is another kind of a shock study. A lot of these are shock studies. Um, so uh, the, pe the person who's going to do the experiment, uh, who's going to deliver the shocks, not really shocks, right? Um, the person who's being experimenter on, experimented on um, overhears the research ass assistant tell the experimenter about the students. And one, in one condition, the group of students that is going to be the subject of shocks delivered by the experimental participant who thinks they're just overhearing a conversation, those students, um, the participant hears the assistant say that the students seemed nice, okay? In the other uh, study, um, the students are described instead as animals. And so, um, and in the third group, the assistant did not label the students at all. So they just weren't given a label. So what they find again, this is another one of these shocking shock studies, is that the intensity of the shock reflected the situation, right? The highest levels of shock were used on those labeled as animals and the least intense shock was given to those labeled nice. The unlabeled group was somewhere in the middle. So this suggests um, that, uh, that, um, that uh, it makes a big difference to uh, the extent to which will uh, harm someone else as to the, deg the degree to which they have been uh, humanized or dehumanized in uh, what I've heard about them. If they've been called nice, a kind of like distinctively human trait, then I will shock them less. If they've been called animals, I'll shock them more. Um, and it seems like, uh, you know, in these studies too, that participants shocked more aggressively over time. And also, these participants reported that they got pleasure from shocking the animals, those in that condition, whereas the, those in the nice condition did not do this. Okay, so dehumanization is an important tool of, um, of uh, you know, uh, demagogues leading their followers um, to commit evil acts. Um, but uh, there are a variety of different tools that these demagogues might use in uh, promoting dehumanization. 
Um, and, and I think like one of the most compelling tools or, or one of the most common tools that we think of maybe is propaganda images. So propaganda images encourage us in part, sometimes uh, propaganda images encourage us to think of the enemy in non-human ways. And I, I think that we can see this across history. I'm just gonna pull two examples uh, from World War II. So um, this is the way in which uh, uh, Japanese war enemies were portrayed by uh, the U.S. Um, propaganda machine during World War II, and the way in which uh, uh, Jews were portrayed by the Nazi um, propaganda machine during World War II. Um, in the American instance, a lot of these images, uh, 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 propaganda images that dehumanized our enemies in the war were drawn by uh, um, Dr. Seuss, in fact. So he had an active role um, promoting this kind of work for the, the um, War Bureau. So this is um, Dr. Seuss for the US Department of Internment, right? He's saying, uh, I mean, like, so you can see the, the title of this, I'm not going to repeat it, but obviously a, a Japanese US citizen here, this is a, a poster supporting the um, Japanese internment during World War II. And we can see in which the way in which uh, Japanese U.S. citizens, Japanese American U.S. citizens were depicted in this. Um, another one of his uh, propaganda images from this time, this is uh, the Honorable Fifth Column, and it says waiting for a signal from home. And so it shows all of these Japanese Americans in California, Washington, and Oregon um, receiving these images. I guess it's is not so much dehumanizing as the previous one. And then here then is the Nazi image of uh, dehumanizing uh, Jewish citizens by portraying them as, as rats in this case. So in all of these instances, and this again has occurred throughout history, these are just two examples from World War II, um, dehumanization has, has uh, played an important role in leading people to harm others. Okay. Um, so so uh, these propaganda images are important tools in, uh, in leading people to uh, commit evil acts. Um, as one researcher writes, the more we see the opposite side as unredeemably evil, the more we do evil in order to combat them. And I think at least that this is pretty resonant given some of uh, you know, the political situation in this country right now. Um, Another kind of examples uh, that's discussed in the uh, article is the idea of a Nazi hate primer in which school children were taught by the Nazis to hate um, uh, Jews, to hate uh, Eastern Europeans who were in Austria and Germany um, and so on. And so by instilling these kinds of uh, dehumanistic perspectives on uh, enemies of the state, you can actually raise children to perform evil acts of the state's interest in them performing. That is by controlling education and propaganda media, national leaders can subtly influence how people see the enemy and what they're willing to do to fight them. And I think this can be done formally as it was in the case of uh, uh, the Nazi um, regime in Germany, or it can be done informally as it might be by like a demagogic um, politician who exploits the media to get a message out there, right? Um, okay. So I think a question that I want you to think about here in relationship to humanization is why does it matter so much? I mean, you know, we're not typically uh, uh, cruel to animals in some way. So why does making us think of our fellow people as animals um, uh, lead us to perform these evil acts? It seems like sort of a mystery to me. And then I think another question is, um, just why is our perception of the humanity of others so fragile? Why are we so inclined to accept uh, the, um, the uh, you know, to, to, to treat others as less than human um, if we are uh, propagandized to do so. Another kind of uh, component that leads to um, uh, consideration of, or, or leads people to act in evil ways is diffuse responsibility, okay? Um, so I think a telling example here, again, comes from World War II. So this is an example of um, involving Reserve Battalion 101, who essentially was this uh, battalion of military police 
Uh, all of them were from Hamburg. They were all from uh, the same area of Germany. Um, they were actually sent to uh, Poland and, and committed um, uh, uh, you know, just uh, terribly horrendous massacres of Polish civilians um, uh, while um, Germany was trying to annex uh, Poland and uh, send um, the Polish citizens to ghettos so that the German Empire can take over this land. So these citizens, um, I mean, these um, this Reserve Battalion 101 is this group of uh, uh, German soldiers, again, all drawn from the same area in discussing um, what led them to, uh, to um, behave in these ways after the war. They reported, I mean, some of them came out and reported on the, the atrocities that they had committed. So one of the important things that they found was the way in which um, was that like the citizens in this um, battalion, the people in this battalion, the German citizens in this battalion were not made to commit these atrocities. They were not made to kill the, um, the residents of uh, these villages they went to. Um, so they weren't forced to do that, but instead what happened was um, uh, they were told that this was the desire. There was like nothing, nothing that could be done for these people. They had to be eliminated in some way. And then um, those of them who did participate in this, um, uh, well, it, it turns out that they sort of felt like their responsibility, the ones who, who initially kind of committed these atrocities, felt that their responsibility was diffused across the group as a whole, and that they were sort of taking on this effort for their other colleagues. And eventually that kind of viewpoint, the idea that these soldiers who were com initially committing the atrocities were taking on the responsibility, um, led other of the more, um, other of the people who were not committing these evil acts to begin with, to take on more and more of the um, of these evil actions, to help diffuse responsibility across the whole unit, uh, across the whole unit, right? So diffusing or spreading responsibility across the whole unit led these battalions to be much more effective in their heinous, heinous uh, massacres of, of Polish citizens, right? So um, if it's the the battalions. Uh, decision, if it's the higher ups decision, all of that can lead us to act in uh, ways that lead uh, to more harm, to more evil. And that might have something to do with de-individuation as well. I'm de-individuating myself if the responsibility is diffused amongst a large group of us. I think we see these same kinds of uh, strategies that we've been talking about. Um, at play in uh, the Islamic State. This is uh, less of an issue nowadays, um, but ISIS, of course, um, uh, you know, de-individuated its perpetrators. Here, two ISIS soldiers are about to assassinate these people they've captured. Um, the two soldiers who are doing this are, of course, de-individuated in the um, black uh, outfit distinctive of ISIS. And of course, the responsibility is diffuse across the Islamic State is in general, you're a soldier within the Islamic State. It's not your responsibility to act in a moral way um, that leads, or it's not your, your um, responsibility to make these decisions about what is to be or isn't to be done, but you are an instrument in a kind of larger project. Okay. Um, this brings us to Scott Atran. So Scott Atran uh, is discussed in detail, uh, or there's an interview with him in the um, article that, uh, or in the podcast you listen to, The Hidden Brain. So Scott Atran um, uh, discusses um, people who join the Islamic State. And, and, and specifically he's talking about people who joined from this uh, Danish group of immigrants. Um, the authorities thought of the, painted these recruits, these are people who went to serve as medics with the Islamic State. And they painted these re recruits as essentially drawn to, to nihilism. They wanted to die, right? Or they thought there was nothing of value, that there was no, nothing valuable in the world. And that's why they joined. That's what the Dutch, the Danish authorities thought at first. But Atrian thinks in fact that this, this has more to do with a twisted idealism than with nihilism, right? 
Um, Atran thinks that the reason in which people are drawn to a revolutionary movements such as National Socialism or ISIS, the, the Nazi party or ISIS, is that these provide meaning, right? He writes that the Islamic State revolution is a revolution. And there really isn't much difference, I see, he claims, in the impulse or the impetus to the Islamic State revolution than to the French Revolution, or the Bolshe Bolshevik Revolution, or to the National so Socialist Revolution. And it appeals to the same sorts of people. Um, I think uh, that Atran's views are interesting. They're a good counterpoint to this. So I, I, I wanted to put them out there so you can think about them in relationship to the Zimbardo article. Um, a, a kind of uh, um, piece that Atran discusses is uh, Orwell's review of Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf, of course, is Hitler's um, uh, account, uh, Hitler's uh, personal account um, that uh, also uh, laid out his kind of viewpoint for the Nazi state. Um, so uh, George Orwell, in writing about this book, asked, what is it about Mr. H Hitler that appeals? What is the essence of the problem? Look at our societies. Orwell himself was British, of course. Capitalist societies offer their people ease, avoidance of risk and pain, security, in short, the good life. And what is the result? Well, the Oxford Student Union, the cream of our intellectuals, votes they will never fight again. And Miss, Mr. Hitler, what is he offering his people? Glory, adventure, even death and destruction. But most of all, transcendence and a feeling of self-sacrifice. So Mr. Hitler has understood the essence of human beings. Human beings need not just short working hours and comfort and security and avoidance of pain. They need, at least intermittently, a feeling of transcendence and self-sacrifice. And so 80 million people now fall down at his feet. So I think this is another kind of component into thinking about evil. It's a situational component still, I think, to some extent, but it is really the kind of appeal um, to be a part of something larger than yourself that can get you into things that are over your head and that lead you to commit evil acts. Okay, so what is the ultimate conclusion on this piece? Well, ultimately, the conclusion is that situations exert more influence than most people, um, civilians and pro professionals in this case, give them credit for. I mean, I, I think you can call that into debate, and I don't want you to take that as a given, but I want you to think about that. That's Zimbardo's point, okay? However, most contemporary Anglo-American psychology, Zimbardo thinks, is based on more dispositional factors, right? And so Zimbardo here exploits kind of metaphor to try and illustrate what he's saying. He's saying, while a few bad apples might spoil the barrel filled with good fruit or people, a barrel filled with vinegar will always transform sweet cucumbers into sour pickle, pickles, regardless of the best intentions, resilience, and genetic nature of those cucumbers, right? So instead of having us operate according to this metaphor, where there are a few bad apples, right? And I think we hear this quite a bit. Um, instead, we should think about, well, what are the kind of situational um, uh, factors that are leading um, to uh, this uh, particular uh, action. I think this is kind of the kind of mindset that we see in um, um, in, in the, the shift from considering racism as kind of a personal aspect to thinking of systemic racism. What are the situational factors that lead people to behave in racist ways, right? That, that's kind of an approach that emphasizes the situational and not what's sort of built into people. A few last thoughts about uh, this. Don't immediately embrace the high moral ground. Um, Zimbardo thinks that distances us good folks from those bad ones. That's what's suggested by dispositionalism. But instead, understand that any, disease, any deed for good or evil that any human being has ever performed or committed, you and I could also perform or commit, given the same situational forces. So this is the last point that Zimbardo leaves us with. And this is a situational question that I want us to discuss this week. That's it for me for now. I look forward to seeing you later this week. Keep an eye out for the next lecture and for uh, your individual homework and your group work. See you soon. Bye.